monthly basis. No, oh, oh, sorry. I used to be there in a weekly basis. Now I'm going every uh, 15 days, every other week. Because, Asakta, you know... Is the already live on YouTube? Because of this no, oh, oh. COVID times. So to. that's why we are not going that much there. Right. But uh, things sir, are getting uh, oh, back hello? to normal. Hello? Hello? Am I audible? Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm just checking. Uh, sir, are we already live on YouTube? I just got into YouTube now, just now. Okay, okay. And uh, through the channel right now, so. You know, we had this meeting, the right now, so this Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It took three hours and uh, 36 minutes. But of course, we started before, you know, chatting, talking to people. I was talking to Dr. Lamb. He arrived uh, maybe 20 minutes before the meeting. So we were talking a lot with the moderator, Natalia, as well, about uh, things in general, waiting for people to arrive. So that's why it took over three hours. But the uh, meeting itself took uh, less than uh, three hours and 10 minutes. It was pretty, pretty long meeting. Uh, but it was good, you know, we covered so many subjects. And uh, of course, it's not possible to do everything in, uh, in one meeting, you know, because uh, there are too many people over there. And uh, we, we, we had to uh, cover all subjects. And uh, we usually uh, separate uh, two questions for each panelist, but uh, usually four people wanted to comment because the cases were so interesting. And uh, so people wanted to comment. And uh, that's what, uh, why I, I, I think it's interesting that uh, we discuss things from uh, Red Nelson because it's a very rich meeting. Yes, sir. And uh, people are going to enjoy a lot. Like I was uh, the keynote speaker Dr. Uh, Lawrence, he was talking about uh, retinous gizes and Dr. Lem about uh, optic nerve feet. All cases were very good. Natarajan's cases, uh, very good as well. So I think it's good that, that we discuss. And hey, Natarajan, I was talking to Yoshi, Yoshihiro Yonekawa. And uh, maybe the uh, seventh uh, retinosome, we could make it a little shorter, maybe for, you know, seven speakers because of the name seven. So we, we are approaching the end of the year. And uh, then it won't, uh, wouldn't last very you know, long. So that could probably be better. What do you think about it? And maybe uh, Yoshi wanted to join us, but uh, he's a, a little busy on call in, in the third week. The uh, first week is next uh, week, so it's not possible. And uh, the other days are yeah. probably not, not suitable for that. What do, what do you think, Aishwara? Maybe, maybe good idea. So I have here Ulysses, good morning. And Rodrigo, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Hudson. Good morning, everybody. A pleasure to have you here. And uh, Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is Aishwara. This is Ulysses and uh, Rodrigo Aish Aishwara. Hello, hello. Hi, hi, Rodrigo. Hi, Ulysses. Hi, Aishwara. Hi. Ulysses Hello. is uh, the resident, and okay. uh, Rodrigo is the Retina Fellow. And, nice, uh, nice to meet you. Aishwara is uh, coming to the uh, Retina Fellowship this year, Aishwara? Yes, sir. Yeah, very cool. Congratulations. Are you getting 
busy already or still the COVID yeah. times don't, don't no, let you uh, We've started to recover and it's starting to get busy now. Uh, it's, I mean, every month is busier than the next. So it's getting better every month. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know the population in India is very large. So I think you get to see uh, too many people, of, of course, you know, it's uh, always busy everywhere. That's what I, I was told. And uh, things are getting back to normal now. And uh, we think you should be uh, a little busier, <laughs> I guess. And uh, so I separated the uh, the videos from from Red Red awesome. and uh, we could go over uh, three to watch. For example, uh, Lawrence Chong uh, lecture on uh, foveal retinoschisis. That was really great. He made this uh, um, uh, review from uh, uh, foveal retinoschisis and uh, especially the myopic foveal retinoschisis. And uh, then we completed with uh, comments uh, from everyone. So I think it's uh, probably a good idea that uh, we could share this, uh, this presentation of him. So I think I will start and uh, since this is going to be recorded as well, so people would be able to uh, join and uh, watch later if they miss it by now. So, okay, could I share my, my screen? Aishwara. Yes, okay. Yeah, I will... Can you see the uh, the screen here? Yeah, now. Let me put it sideways. Can you see the whole picture? So I will probably start the uh, the video, but then. I will move it forward a little bit so that uh, we go straight to the uh, uh, presentation from Dr. Lawrence, okay? So we were starting the meeting here. J J Deep is coming. Hi, Jadeep. Congratulations for your article with uh, Natarajan at India, India Junior Ophthalmology. So uh, we are starting the, uh, the meeting, just uh, showing uh, the beginning Hello, of the meeting. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, we, we were busy in the meeting uh, last Saturday from Red So, Hello. I decided to show you some highlights of the meeting. Uh, okay. okay. Saturday, we're just uh, starting the video there, but uh, I'm going to move it forward so that we uh, show you the uh, first lecture from Dr. Lawrence Chong. Dr. Lawrence Chong made a very good review of foveal uh, retinoschisis, especially the myopic one. And uh, uh, that was interesting. So I will, I will keep moving the video forward. And I would like, Ashwara, could you admit uh, people when they get in? Because I'll put the, uh, the screen larger here. No, sir, sure. no problem. I'll do that. And uh, I made you co-host. And... Uh, the other guys as well. So whenever uh, people approach, you just uh, make them go. Uh, I mean, just uh, let them in. 
So this is uh, Lawrence and uh, we will start with this uh, with his uh, talk on the foveal retinoschisis. Let me just uh, put here the mic. It's better now. It was pretty hot some uh, weeks ago. It's, uh, long. It's, uh, it's quite warm. It's not hot, but uh, it's windy. So Can you hear the sound? It's sunny also. It's a nice day close to the beach also. Yes, yes, we can hear, but it's a little low. Low? Let, let me put a little... Yeah, you can increase the volume a bit. Uh, a bit low. Okay, let me just uh, control you, you can it. Increase. You can increase the volume, sir. Yeah, sure. I will do that now. How are you, my friend? Let me put it. Better now? To start his talk on... Uh, yes, better. Topic, topic, uh, cases, and uh, I thank you again for being a keynote speaker. It's always a pleasure to... Better now? From your cases, to learn with you, and... Uh, yeah, now it's better. And if you want to share your, your screen... I guess it's better now. So... Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Lawrence Chong's lecture on the uh, myopic foveal uh, schizis here. So I think the sound is, is better now. So I, I put the uh, speaker here right next to the, uh, to the speaker, to the microphone. So we should be okay now. If I can get the sound. Uh, the, the weather is just okay. pleasure to learn from your cases, to learn with you, and uh, I'll leave it to you to start. And if you want to share your your screen. He's arranging his lights to start. Everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Well, uh, it's just a very short talk today on, uh, on uh, macular retinal stasis, particularly myopic foveal stasis, which I find a very interesting disorder, which probably Wai Cheng sees a lot of in Hong Kong. Uh, it's another visual retinal interface disorder, uh, one of many that we now know, including macular puckers and holes, <coughs> and now we add uh, myopic uh, foveal schisis to that list. Uh, it was really only recognized with the advent of OCT, and probably the terminology is not particularly accurate. It isn't really a splitting of the middle sensory retina, because what we see are these pillars <coughs> In the, surrounded by cystoid spaces, and it's most commonly seen over a staphyloma. There was some suspicion prior to OCT that maybe there was a retinal schesis over these uh, staphylomas because uh, uh, Phillips, in, as early as 1958, thought there was a retinal detachment, but he looked and looked and looked and couldn't really find a retinal hole. And with the advent of OCT, several uh, uh, clinical uh, groups reported a very high incidence of foveal macular schesis over the macular hole, uh, ranging from 34% to 100%. Uh, and, uh, and in the Beijing ISIS uh, study, uh, it showed that a lot of highly myopic eyes really had uh, myopic foveal schesis over the staphyloma. 
up to a third. There have been various mechanisms proposed for a myopic foveal schesis. Uh, visual, uh, number one, is it a vitreal retinal interface abnormality? And that to me seems the most likely explanation at this point. People have talked about retinal stretching, a primary degeneration of the retina, or even a result of the staphyloma itself. But let's talk about vitreal retinal interface abnormalities. If you look at the OCT evidence, not only do you see the myopic foveoschesis, but you see other evidence of vitreal retinal interface disease. You, you can see either epiretinal membranes, vascular microfolds, uh, you can see paravascular retinal holes, ILM detachments. Uh, you can also see simultaneous, simultaneous splitting of inner and outer retinal layers, ILM detachments, all suggestive that this is a vitreal retinal interface disorder. Again, uh, the Beijing ICE study showed uh, a significant a, a con concomitant evidence of vitreal retinal interface disorder. Clinical evidence, uh, uh, Spade and Fisher reported uh, uh, in uh, their repair of myopic macular detachments that uh, identification of cortical plaques by triamcinolone and <clears throat> scraping with the tonal scraper. And uh, Yasuo Tano and his group in 2006 also found cortical vitreous in reoperating a, a failed myopic macular detachment. There's been ultrastructural evidence, and mainly this ultrastructural evidence comes from peeled ILM. And here in 2005, very early on, uh, they compared myopic uh, foveal schesis to idiopathic macular hole, comparing the internal limiting membrane. And they found that uh, there was no collagen fiber or cellular debris on the inner surface of the ILM in idiopathic macular hole but all 10 of the patients with myopic foveal schesis had uh, not only collagen, but, but cellular debris on the internal limiting membrane. And just, uh, and just last month, if you look in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, there's been another comparison, uh, this time between myopic foveal schesis and idiopathic epiretinal membrane. And as you could see, there are very much there are, there are quite similarities in terms of cell types. So if you look over here, hyalocytes, myofibroblast-like cells, fibroblasts, <laughs> fibrous astrocytes, very similar in terms uh, between the myopic foveal schesis and the idiopathic epiretinal membrane-associated foveal schesis. You can see the collagen types are very similar, especially the fibrous long spacing collagen, which is indicative of, of, uh, of age-related posterior vitreous detachment. And as we know, uh, in myopic, highly myopic patients, uh, this degeneration of the vitreous, which we associate with being age-related, occurs much earlier in the myopic individuals. But on the left side, you can see it's quite curious that when you have idiopathic epiretinal membrane, you don't have much in the way of irregularity or thinning of the internal limiting membrane, whereas that's exclusively seen in the myopic foveal schesis. And when you look at the internal limiting membrane and you look for remnants of nerve fiber layer, you generally don't see it with idiopathic epiretinal membrane, but you see it with myopic foveal schesis. So that's the main difference between the two. This was a very interesting comment. Uh, difference, the, uh, the difference between the two. So I will play it again, just a second. Again, uh, the Beijing ice study. The uh, sound is okay. So, yes, uh, it's okay. A, 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 a con concomitant evidence of vitreal retinal interface disorder. Clinical evidence. Uh, uh, Spade and Fisher reported. Uh, uh, in uh, their repair of myopic macular detachments, that uh, identification of cortical plaques by triamcinolone and <clears throat> scraping with the tonal scraper. And uh, Yasuo Tano and his group in 2006 
also found cortical vitreous in reoperating a, a failed myopic macular detachment. There's been ultrastructural evidence, and mainly this ultrastructural evidence comes from peeled ILM. And here in 2005, very early on, uh, they compared myopic uh, foveal schesis to idiopathic macro hole, comparing the internal limiting membrane. And they found that uh, there was no collagen fiber or cellular debris on the inner surface of the ILM in idiopathic macro hole. But all 10 of the patients with myopic foveal schesis had uh, not only collagen, but, but cellular debris on the internal limiting membrane. And just, uh, and just last month, if you look in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, there's been another comparison, uh, this time between myopic foveal schesis and idiopathic epiretinal membrane. And as you could see, they're very much, there, are, there are quite similarities in terms of cell types. So if you look over here, hyalocytes, myofibroblast-like cells, fibroblasts, fibrous astrocytes, very similar in terms uh, between the myopic foveal schesis and the idiopathic epiretinal membrane associated foveal schesis. You can see the collagen types are very similar, especially the fibrous long spacing collagen, which is indicative of, of, uh, of age-related posterior vitreous detachment. And as we know, uh, in myopic, highly myopic patients, uh, this degeneration of the vitreous, which we associate with being age-related, occurs much earlier in the myopic individuals. But on the left side, you can see it's quite curious that when you have idiopathic epiretinal membrane, you don't have much in the way of irregularity or thinning of the internal limiting membrane, whereas that's exclusively seen in the myopic foveal schesis. And when you look at the internal limiting membrane and you look for remnants of nerve fiber layer, you generally don't see it with idiopathic epiretinal membrane, but you see it with myopic foveal schesis. So that's the main difference between the two. So interesting comments, the di difference between the ILM and the fov uh, myopic foveal schesis. Dur uh, during surgery, again, there's been a description of the vitreal retinal interface as being rigid. Oops. Sorry, my, my uh, S was 3.9% action of vision. There certainly is worse vision with the foveal detachment. Uh, retinal stretching uh, was described by Dick Green and an ophthalmic uh, pathology group. And the other theory is uh, that there's a primary degeneration uh, of the retina. We, we know that the focal ERGs are, abnorma are abnormal in myopic foveal schesis. And finally, uh, maybe uh, there's a thought that the staphyloma itself uh, induces the myopic foveal schesis. But I think uh, I'm pretty convinced, and I think most of us are convinced, that it's another form of vitreal retinal interface uh, abnorm uh, abnormality. Uh, what, what's the natural history of a myopic foveal schesis? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the retinal thickness correlates poorly with uh, the prediction of vision. There certainly is worse vision with the foveal detachment. Gaucher in 2007 uh, showed worsening of retinal schesis and vision in 20 of his 29 eyes. Shimada uh, in 2013 showed that about 12% of myopic foveal schesis progress, whereas 3.9% uh, improved. We know that staphyloma is present in 9 to 34% of uh, highly myopic eyes with myopic foveal schesis. Associated findings were foveal detachment in almost a third of a Gaucher's 29 eyes. You can have associated macro hole uh, and associated uh, uh, macro detachment. The surgical repair, uh, several uh, groups have reported the success 
of vitrectomy, ILM peeling, and C3F8 gas. And now that we understand uh, that the pathophysiology of myopic paleothesis <clears throat> involves probably a posterior vitreous detachment, uh, a fibril cellular proliferation on the surface of probably a very thin myopic retina and a physical uh, uh, change to the retina uh, that involves uh, uh, pillaring of retinal pillars surrounded by cystoid uh, spaces. So what are the surgical indications? Surgical indication is certainly a progressive loss of vision. And I'd like to just show you, conclude with an unusual case, and perhaps I'd like a, uh, an opinion of, of, of what you think of my management of this case. Would you have managed it this way and why this management works? So this is a patient with bilateral my, uh, high myopia, a Caucasian patient, and the right eye has had a drop of vision uh, from 2030s to 2100 plus three, and the OCT looks like on the bottom. So I performed a vitrectomy island peeling, and at that time we didn't have uh, the brilliant blue, we used ICG, and the foveal schesis uh, resolves, and, and eventually, uh, eight months later, it's back to normal, 2032 uh, plus uh, two. Uh, then there's a recurrent schesis and the vision drops to 2063 plus three. And I take the patient back to the operating room. Uh, I look for more ILM, put C3F8 gas, and that was quite successful. And you could see uh, the uh, schesis resolves, it flattens out, but then a macro hole develops. And for me, a macro hole uh, in uh, the presence of a high myope and a staphyloma, to me, that's the kiss of death. To me, those are the most difficult things to repair. So what did I do? I decided just to try a gas fluid exchange, just, just to be uh, uh, provocative. And to my surprise, uh, the macro hole closes and the retinal detachment flattens and the vision's 2160 plus four. Now there's a recurrent macro hole, and the vision was is 2080 plus one. Let's see if I can get it to go to the next slide. So I perform a gas fluid exchange, another gas fluid exchange, which I thought would never work, and the vision comes back to 2032 again. Now there's a recurrent retinal schesis again, and so what do I do? What should we do at this point? Should we go with gas, another vitrectomy with gas? Should we do a gas fluid exchange? Would we do oil? And uh, what I did instead was another gas fluid exchange and vision comes back every time. And since, since then, she's had uh, multiple uh, gas fluid I exchanges, but uh, uh, that concludes my talk, but uh, I'm curious as to uh, whether anybody would have done so many gas fluid exchanges, and particularly this, I've never repaired uh, a macro hole uh, in a retinal detachment over a staphyloma just with gas alone. So uh, I'm curious as to what uh, uh, others might have an opinion on this. So this is interesting case, J.D., you saw that, yes, that uh, uh, it did so many uh, air fluid exchanges to curb the situation. So uh, he could uh, attach the retina and close the, the hole uh, all times. Correct. And uh, interesting that uh, he did not decide to use silicone oil. And uh, you're going to hear on the comments from Dr. Lamb and uh, other people that uh, he could probably yeah. get away with that by putting silicone oil good. and uh, waiting a bit longer. What, would you do so many effort exchanges? Well, uh, I think if the g gas is helping, then I think, as you said, that it would be beneficial if we put 
it uh, oil and it may remain longer because if the tamponade is helping i think if the tamponade of the gas is helping to close the hole and uh, uh, resolve the crisis then i think uh, oil would have been a better option yeah i think that too uh yeah comment. there's another thing there's another thing which i have observed i mean in su- such a scenario where uh, macular buckles have been done so in case there is a recurrence and the but that is more when there is a uh, what do you say macular uh, detachment along with the scaphis mhm yeah. so macular buckling is one option not in this case particularly because if it was working with a uh, fluid gas section probably oil would have been better yeah sometimes in this case could probably work because you need a support at the macular area and uh, if yeah. uh, the skisis uh this they start uh, opening uh again probably a good idea would be to do the macular buckle sure yeah correct uh, correct so there are comments uh come with these too so i will uh, just uh, show you uh the comments from this uh sure. this talk so that sure. we close this this talk can you yeah. see the uh where is my video okay Thanks very much. In great case, great case, Lawrence. And uh, I would like the comments first from uh, Dr. Lem and afterwards for, from Dr. André Jucá. Dr. Lem, what, what do you, did you think? Did you get many cases of uh, fluvial schizis? Yes, we have quite a number of uh, myopic fluvial schizis mainly because uh, it's quite common in Asian populations because there's a higher uh, prevalence of um, myopes um, among the Asian countries. Um, I never have a case like this, though, I have to say, that um, resolve with gas flow exchange, recur, and then uh, repeat it, and resolve and repeat it. And um, actually, I find it very fascinating that it should recur. You know, <coughs> the... Um, IOM and all the um, superficial tractions has been uh, eliminated from previous surgery, then what is allowing that to recur is uh, uh, an interesting kind of mechanism that I'm not fully understand. But for the fact that it has keep coming back and, and then settle each time with the uh, gas free exchange, then I would say it makes sense to use the silicone oil However, the, the question then is, are you going to leave the oil in for uh, forever so that you don't have to keep doing this back and forth? Um, I remember um, at one time I did uh, with an uh, uh, older lady with a um, myopic um, macular hole with detachment. I did some light laser around the peripheral area. And whether that did anything to... Um, help to uh, create a, uh, an adhesions that allow the um, uh, retina to stay on and not to recur. I'm not sure, but that could be another consideration to see if that could have help the, um, um, form some adhesions to prevent it from recurring. But um, a very challenging situation, I don't know for sure. I haven't experienced that myself. Well, Wai Ching, uh, I, I've never done this, and I'm curious about your experience with macro buckling. Have, have you had some experience with macro buckling? Um, no, no, I, I haven't done macro buckling. Um, uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, uh, my colleagues in Hong Kong had, and uh, um, the Japanese group also had. And um, it, um, yeah, that will be interesting. That, that will definitely relieve the, uh, the uh, potential tractions there. And... Um, that will be uh, a good consideration. Uh, I think that that could be uh, that could be it. Yeah. So, I haven't had a case like that. I would like to thank you, Lord Strong, for the uh, very nice review on uh, phobia schizes. 
uh, myofibrillar schisms, but I did have a case uh, of a macular hole in which the patient didn't uh, stay in prone position. And I thought I had uh, relieved all the traction and I just performed an air fluid exchange in the uh, uh, office and uh, the patient put himself in prone position and the macular hole just closed. So I, I think uh, if there is no traction, it makes sense to just uh, perform uh, a fluid air exchange and put some, maybe some gas, non-expensive gas, and ask the patient to, to be in the position. Because uh, in this case, uh, it worked for me. And maybe it was the same mechanism, since we, you relieved all the traction before. But uh, it's still in my uh, excuses that guy that uh, yeah, yeah. compression on and you were right maybe a buckle it's uh, I haven't done it it seems quite challenging to do it mm -hmm. maybe the solution the final solution Hudson, can I make a comment uh, Hudson, yeah. you're, you're muted Hudson. Okay, so you, uh, I think, uh, hi, uh, Larry. It was hi. a great case, and uh, sorry I joined a little late. So I had a similar patient, and then I, we had Barbara from um, Italy visiting us, and then later I shared the pictures, and she said, Macular cycle. So I, that was my only case I did, and I actually have my fellow, it's uh, Nicholas Labori, who's practicing in um, Georgia, Tbilisi. So he does a lot of macular buckling. So I, went through his video and then Barbara's video several times and then I did the surgery. The patient did well, but it only one case I did a macular buckle. Exactly similar case. But it was a challenge to make sure the macular buckle is exactly in a position for, for the macular buckle. Wow. Yeah, nice to see you, Natarajan. <laughs> I know you had a busy week, and we had this busy week with <laughs> you and uh, with the residents and fellows program. It has been good. You know, I invited uh, Vihap Seti as well to participate as well as everybody, and Nageswar is always there, and uh, it's been good, you know? And uh, uh, I want to introduce you, uh, Natalia. Natalia, this is Natarajan, and uh, Natalia is our moderator uh, together with me. Uh, she did a residency here at the iBank Foundation and then she did the Strabismus. This is Natarajan. Hi, Natalia. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to see you. So, so Natalia, uh, could you call the, uh, the next speaker? Yes, sure. Um, I'm going to call Dr. Oh, so that was the case. Interesting case. And uh, as you yeah. said, Jadeep, they talked yeah. about uh, macular buckle. I think macular buckle is uh, it's a good thing to do, but uh, it's not easy at all. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, do little, as, uh, you really need, uh, if there's a learning curve, and I have not attempted it, but uh, where I was earlier at, in Chennai, at Shankarit Valley, there were a couple of surgeons who were performing them and had a decent series of patients. So, but then uh, the results are a little mixed and patient selection is very, very crucial there. I mean, uh, what kind of patient you are going to select and where it is going to really work, you need to be very uh, careful and sure. Yeah, yeah, so, I gotta be careful it's, not it's a, to. It's a good in, in such cases. It's a good option because these, uh, as as they said, these are very difficult cases to manage. They they keep recurring and they they don't do very well with conventional surgery like our vitrectomy and ILM peeling with the gas. So especially when there's a steep cephaloma and a macular hole along with the feces and some macular detachment. Then it is really tough to, even oil doesn't tampon out inside the cephaloma, so it's, it's a bit tough in such cases. Yeah, interesting that you mentioned the uh, oil, 
And uh, I have uh, a few cases of uh, retinal detachment with a uh, macular hole. And uh, of course, when I was attempting to peel the ILM, the retina, detached the retina is very mobile. So it's not possible to peel it very well without having the retina uh, move all the time. So I decided to uh, use always in this case is uh, yeah. before carbon liquids, Beautiful. after I did the fluid exchange, yeah. after uh, I stained with brilliant blue, and then I used before carbon liquids. And then interesting, I have some videos displayed on YouTube and iTube as well. Uh, when I was peeling the ILM under before carbon liquids, I, you know, the uh, even though the before carbon liquid was above the hole, the retina would move uh, at the macular hole area, causing some distortion. So if you have the hole like that and uh, you you peel it around the ILM, the hole would distort. You see, you had this uh, distortion of the uh, configuration, the shape of the uh, hole. So that helps. It closed, and then, as you said, okay. there is not too much uh, surface contact of the uh, silicone oil as good as the gas. But when I used the silicone oil, and after the surgery, the patient was uh, facing down, the uh, silicone oil goes up. And so those cases I have, I have the OCT preoperatively and the postoperative OCT, and the hole closed. This is very interesting because I used right. silicone oil for that purpose. I peeled the ILM, and so the hole, the hole uh, closed very interestingly. But I did not only uh, did the maneuver of ILM peeling uh, without paying attention to the uh, shape of the hole. You, 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 all the time I was peeling, the hole was uh, sort of uh, changing its shape. This is very interesting to consider because uh, if you can, uh, not by massaging the hole, not by force, uh, putting a forceps over the, the hole, you might get some damage uh, in the structural uh, uh, retina there with the photoreceptors and the, the edges of the hole. So the good thing that I did was to peel the ILM, and then with the force of the peeling, I was distortion, making distortion of the hole and making it close. And then that it's like a triggering factor for the postoperative period, because after some time in the face position, the, the hole closed. I have a uh, few cases, good cases on that. And uh, I don't know whether you consider doing this uh, ILM peel for macular hole on their uh, before carbon liquids, but I think it works very good for me. Yes, uh, yes, uh, I, I uh, do the same thing. I exactly the same thing for macular hole with the retinal detachment. I do the vitrectomy, then do the fluid gas exchange, stain with brilliant blue, and then under uh, PFCL for flow carbon liquid, I do the ILM peeling. So it is... Uh, uh, the distortion of the hole, I guess, uh, I haven't seen. Maybe in myopic patients with the cephaloma, the retina is really thinned out. So it might, you know, that might be the case why the, there is a distortion. And if you peel maybe towards the hole, towards the center, that might help to pull the retina towards the center and try to reduce the size of the hole. And that might help in closing the hole. Yes, yes, very good thoughts. And uh, this case do you, is... Do you, like, any time uh, consider going with a soft tip cannula and uh, going to the hole and just while the fluid gas exchange is on in the end of the surgery and try to remove some fluid there? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Hole. Choose the soft cannula, yeah. Passive suction. That's a good with... idea. Yeah. And, uh, that might for... just approximate the hole a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And for recurrent macular holes, I was talking to 
David uh, Chow from Canada. He taught me some uh, maneuvers doing the uh, uh, these uh, 41 cannula subretinal submacular hole uh, injection of BSS uh, uh, with uh, the aid of the uh, constellation or stellaris or whatever system you have. So you keep okay. pushing with the pedal and injecting and uh, actually detaching underneath the hole, oh, the retina oh, there, okay. so would probably make it easier. Make to, it more, uh, there's like, you know, yeah, kind of elastic. Yeah. elastic, yeah. I understand. And for the case I did, it worked. And uh, I kept doing, and for recurrent uh, cases, some work, some do not, depending on the chronicity of the hole and how long it's been there. And, uh, but we should always try to do something for recurrent macular holes. And I think we should not uh, never give it up. And uh, if you don't have uh, traction on the retinal surface, if you remove the uh, epiretinal membranes and the internal limiting membranes, I think you should go uh, seek for whatever is causing the hole to get, uh, you know, open. And sometimes it won't open at all. And then it would be better off uh, dealing with that with, uh, you know, uh, ILM stuffing, amniotic membranes, RPE transplantation. Then I, I would try those uh, other options and uh, uh, right. that, that would work. And uh, have you ever uh, uh, performed this uh, ILM stuffing technique to insert the ILM inside the hole? Uh, well, yes, I have. I have done that, and uh, like few uh, few years back, I was doing it regularly. Now I have reduced to do it because most of the holes will close uh, uh, with our routine ILM techniques. Uh, I just ILM peeling, but yeah, in case the hole is a little big, at least greater than 800 microns, then I do the ILM stuffing or inverted flap technique. So that helps. Yeah, good idea. Good idea to do the ILM flap technique. And uh, I will sh just show you to complete this uh, uh, our uh, this presentation. Just one one more thing. Uh, uh, do you like how frequently have do you come across a recurrent macular hole, some something which has closed or then opening back again? I I really haven't come across something like that in my practice. I, I like I like how frequently I, I like doing, you know, I go uh, for the surgery, for the primary surgery, if it doesn't close. And uh, the next surgery of mine would be to uh, perform a good OCT and see whether there are uh, too many attachments in the uh, macular area, the foveal area. And uh, well, I could decide on any of these techniques I mentioned, but uh, most of the times for my second uh, macular hole surgery in a recurrent case, I like getting the ILM elsewhere because I already done the ILM pitting around the macular hole. So I would get, and uh, the Lawrence Chung also mentioned he does that too. And I would get uh, the ILM elsewhere. And stop I would that just, ILM. Uh, would yeah, stop that I, ILM to the... Yes, I will, I, will, I will look for an ILM elsewhere and uh, put the uh, Britain Blue again and uh, grab the ILM and uh, stuff it in the uh, macular hole. And uh, if it doesn't get steel, and then I would use before carbon liquid to make it go down and... Uh, and then I would perform this very, very slow air fluid exchange to keep the ILM inside the hole. Oh, you, you would put PFCL, okay. And uh, yeah, yeah. then you would put the very slow fluid gas exchange from the nasal side, nasal to yeah, the disc. Very slow, very slow. Pressure 20 or under 20, 15, 20, very, very slow, very slow. And, uh, because we have a jet sound, the ILM comes out very easily. Yes. And far away from the macular hole. And a, a good thing is that if you perform the direct air fluid exchange, if you go for the direct air fluid exchange, meaning that 
uh, you are inserted in uh, silicon oil and uh, for those cases of retinal detachment and then removing the perforo carbon liquid and then I would be very slow too. I have a video Hello. with the droplet coming out of the hole. Like here, you have the LM, you have the droplet re being removed, yeah. and it's, it's like a, yeah. a, a, a kissing between them. And I just removed the uh, before carbon liquid, and the, the LM fall back again in, inside the macular hole. I have this ah. video. This very cool video, and I will share with you. Uh, great, great. Later, okay. later. So I will do I anything. Have tried for... Not I was tried the, putting uh, a small uh, drop of viscoelastic on the ILM, yeah, on the hole. Viscoelastic? Good yeah. idea. Good idea too. Good idea too. And sometimes it floats. Uh, sometimes it floats, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's heavy enough. You know why? Because after you, uh, you do cataract surgery combined with uh, vitrectomy, and you have some... Uh, yeah, viscoelastic sure. uh, inside the, uh, you have some viscoelastic inside the, uh, the vitreous cavity, it goes yes. straight down. And yes, uh, yes, it goes yes. straight down. It's difficult to it, take it uh, out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it helps pushing the ILM back inside the hole. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, interesting that uh, we are discussing these uh, retinosomes as so interesting cases and things that uh, we should consider. Uh, maybe some people do things differently in, the, in, in other areas, but uh, I do like that. And uh, uh, I presented this time, it was an epiretinal diabetic retinopathy uh, case, but uh, our friend uh, Nery showed a case where he stuffed the uh, ILM inside the hole. And uh, I will just go over that very quickly so that you see. Sure. Is, uh, and then uh, we discuss and uh, end this presentation. I think these two cases, you know, are so interesting to to show. So can you see the screen here? Yes, I can see. Yes. Can you guys see the screen now? Yeah. Yes, yes, so good. Let me try it's to... Really I'm just trying to enlarge it a little bit. Okay, just a second. I will enlarge. Okay. Yes, please. That's it. So. Yes, I I will talk about one case. Okay. With the macula hole. The the patient's female, 71 years, lost vision, left eye, and the macula hole, large macula hole, now. 926 and I uh, you use the macro hole treatment by interaction of the internal limited membrane to overlay. The macro hole is the assistance of the perfect carbon liquids to stabilize the the membrane. In this video I was the the vitrectomy then put the blue brilliant blue to see the membrane and uh, to make the, the peeling and elevate the retina the, the attractions of the, the membrane and put into the membrane in the hole. The left and the right. And in this moment, should the, the membrane not go out into the, the, the hole, I put the perfluorocarbon. carbon. In this moment, I into them. Now on the perfluorocarbon carbon liquid. So did this stuff in technique. So it's cool. Good good image. Yeah. Yeah. In this moment that Dr. Woodson, I put the perfluorocarbon carbon and now change for the the fluid of the gas 
and the membrane not got out. So he did a very slow air fluid exchange. Yeah. I've done okay, that so, in cases. And, so uh, how, when, how do you remove the perfluorocarbon in the end? Con oil, I do direct exchange. You're not in this yes. case. I think you did gas, no? Yes, I put the gas, and this is the, the follow-up. And five days, the membranes into the, the, the hole, and the sixth week finish is closed. Wow. Before and after. So wow. good, the cicatrices. Congratulations, 2060. Very good, and the uh, hole's closed. Yes. Yeah. So, like. that is a, an honor to have you present this case, and uh, I've done some cases of uh, stuffing technique as well, and uh, sometimes you have such large macular holes and you do not have much to do, and uh, then... So, interesting case, you see. And uh, you asked how he uh, removed the uh, before carbon. Yeah, yeah, he did the nephilim exchange very slow, as I mentioned, and uh, he's into mm. my service. So we work together and okay. uh, we, do, we do the same, you know. And uh, we got to be very slow. And uh, I usually, as I said, I, I go for a nephilim exchange of uh, 20 pressure, you know, not 20, 25, not more than that, very slow. I don't go with uh, the, the backflush cannula straight at the uh, uh, macular area. I go nasally towards uh, near right. the optic nerve, and then from there I bend the eye a little bit to the nasal side so that the fluid, the remaining fluid, will be uh, sideways and uh, in the position, dependent position, so I, I get the last droplet of uh, perforated carbon liquid at more close to the nasal area. Understand what I mean? And uh, and then that that helps. You 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 okay. don't uh, you, the ILM doesn't escape the uh, whole the whole area the, the, uh, inside the uh, the hole. So interesting to discuss those cases from the retinosome. Uh, of course, we have a lot more, but uh, we probably, uh, we discussed it here, you know, from the beginning of the meeting, we, we have more cases, we're short cases, and uh, we should go uh, discuss these cases uh, in the, another opportunity. But uh, right, right. Do, do, does anybody want, want to comment on those cases again? And uh, or any other ideas on that? Natarajan, would you like to to comment on the case, on the cases we presented? Uh, so which case, uh, Yeah, this uh, macular hole stuffing technique. Yeah, How often I, have, I, heard like JD, I heard JD telling about the stuffing technique. So we do it only when the, uh, at least I do only a traumatic macular hole when the la hole is larger. But if it's an idiopathic macular hole, as uh, Jaydeep said, I think it closes when you do an island peeling. Yes, yes. Traumatic macular holes, yeah, we should do something extra for them. Yeah, it, it yes. it's, uh, sounds good. And uh, especially for uh, very large macular holes as well. You know, some some large macular holes, you won't believe they will ever close. And uh, uh, sometimes with the stuffing technique, they, they close. But we, we, don't, we don't have a uh, 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 rule for that. And uh, that's going to work in every case. That's the thing. And uh, uh, I'm not very concerned about doing the RPE transplantation, if, even though it could well look good in the shape of the OCT, but the function, the visual acuity uh, does not always come as good as we uh, expect to. Uh, Carlos, Carlos, good morning. Do you Hello, doctor. Come? Good morning. Good morning. Do you like doing the, um, uh, this uh, Macular hole peeling and then stuffing the uh, ILM inside the hole? Yes, of sure. Uh, you should be doing when, more, kid. When, uh, when the macular hole is bigger, I ever 
put the ILM in Mackler. In the oh. inside the hole, yeah. Good idea, good idea. We should keep trying doing uh, something different for the patient. Always. Yeah. So, uh, Aishwara, any comments on that? Uh, no, sir. Uh, this is actually very good. Nice to see all the videos, sir. I mean, uh, I'm still learning, so it was still a bit of a learning stage for me. All right. So we are closing this meeting. Jadeep, thank you very much for your comments. Your comments yes, on the macular yes, buckle and this this nice case is interesting cases. Yeah. yeah, interesting cases. We have we have more, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, I'll be talking this weekend about you know uh, sparing the lens in vitrectomy. And another okay. lecture here in the Retinalsum uh, 6 Great. from André Juca. He was talking about the advantages and the advantages of having the, uh, the lens of, uh, of doing phaco vitrectomies or only vitrectomy without doing phaco. And uh, this, is, this was interesting. But my task next uh, Saturday morning, I'll be talking in the trauma event. Uh, from okay. Hugo Pampo here in the, uh, South America, from Colombia, is to, to, to show how important it is to spare the lens for, you know, for vitrectomies. So thank you very much, yeah. everybody, for participating. This uh, will be in uh, YouTube as well. And... Uh, Anything on, on those cases in which we could uh, participate and uh, talk and discuss in any time. And uh, it's very important that we, we keep discussing. And the good thing of all this is uh, that we discuss and learn with uh, each other. And I'll, I will leave it to Natarajan to close this meeting. Thank you, Natarajan. It was good. You yes. know, it's uh, over one hour we are discussing here these uh, cases. Yes. yes. But so you are you, are, you are already left the hospital today? Yes, and then come home now. Yeah, Me it's too. good. Yeah. I like our shirt. You like our shirt? <laughs> Boss. <laughs> yeah, the Brazilian one, you know, was uh, very good. I was trying yes. to find a, a shirt from India, but I don't find it here anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, sorry, not oh, Sao Paulo. Yeah, Sao Paulo. Yes. Yeah, good. You were in Sao Paulo in the World uh, World Retina Congress in 2006? Uh, no, no. I came to Porto Alegre uh, last year, 2019, June. Ah, okay. Very interesting then. I came for that South, South Brazil Ophthalmics meeting. Uh, oh, I can remember. Yeah, two years ago. Yes. I remember. Yeah, yeah. Just after, I think, the same year of the World uh, Congress in Fort Lauderdale that we participated in the same year, I think yes. by the end of the year you went to, you came to Brazil, yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. So thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, thank you. Sir. Thank, thank you, Jadip and uh, Aishwara you, for sir. participating, and Carlos and uh, everybody. And uh, See you next week. Have a great week, you. You all. You too. You too. Have a great week. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.